In her keynote, Stephanie will answer why complexity is the number one management challenge. The floor is yours. It's not working, st no it is, okay. Um, I would like to start with a question. So it's, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. You heard a lot of stuff. You discussed a lot of stuff. What is the state of your mind? You're still able to hear something? You're full? You How are you? So this is, I'm still up and running. Oh, <laughs> something in between up and running and Okay, this will, this will work for the next couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> we were in a lot of discussions. What I heard today is, was a separation between people looking at the individuals to get them to become more agile or to do a transformation into an agile organization or whatever you call it, and a different perspective saying you have to change the system. And this is something that I want to pick up and um, talk about um, and talk with you about. Um, so when I talk about agility or becoming more agile, I come with a very system theory perspective. And people like me, we look at organizations, we look at work, we look at teamwork from a very systemic perspective. And this means that um, organizations are by definition a complex system. And agility, system, complexity, these are all buzzwords, of course. We use them in many different ways. And we well, usually do not clearly define them when we use them. So we might have, I don't know, about 50 or 60 different definitions of what complexity and uh, a system is in mind. And this is why we do um, some definition work now. And um, the good thing, when you, when you come to a very strict and simple definition of what a system really is, you at the same time have the definition for complexity. And this is my uh, topic, of course. And the good thing is that um, the best example for a complex system you carry with you every day. That's your body. Your body consists of flesh, bones, blood, circuits, organs, hormones, whatever else you can imagine. And these elements, they are related to each other. Can you agree on that? They are not separated, they have something to do with each other. So you have interconnectedness in your body. And this is a definition for complexity, a lot of elements being interconnected. And that is, that is okay, that's neither good nor bad, but it has some consequences. And these consequences make it challenging sometimes for us to work in such complex systems, lead people in those systems, or even manage those systems. And um, I want to pick out some of these consequences or aspects of complex systems. And the first it is that these systems are dynamic. It's pretty obvious when you look at your body, because, well, I'm sorry, but we're growing old. Or we're more polite. We're saying we first we grow up, then we are adults, and then we're growing old. But fact is, from day one, it just goes into one direction. And you can't stop that process. There is never a time of nothing's happening. And it's the same with our organizations, with our departments or our projects. We always have an aspect of time pressure because these systems always evolve. There's always something happening. That's not a problem, but we just should keep that in mind because no organization, no project waits for your one and only great decision or for your one and only idea. People do something. They talk to each other, they send emails, they decide or they don't decide. So there's always something happening. The next thing which can be quite challenging is that those systems are intransparent. If I ask you what I did a few minutes before, how are you right now? Well, you can give an answer when you are aware of your body, 
you can say something like, yeah, well, I'm getting a little bit of tired, or I'm still powerful, great, or that the back of the chair is doing something with your back, whatever. If I ask you, how are you feeling tomorrow morning, 7.30 before the first coffee, what's your answer? Pardon me? You're not answering? Okay. <laughs> okay. You're still out of order at that time? What's your answer? 7.30 before the first coffee. You're great? How do you know? You don't know, but she said she knows. <laughs> okay, and you know that? Because of what? You feel it, okay. So sometimes the people say things like, yeah, it depends how many beers I will have at the hotel bar tonight or if my wife want to go for an argument or stuff like that. But the truth is you can't tell. You can't really tell what the state of your body will be tomorrow morning, 7.30, before the first coffee, because it's not predictable. You can't say what the state of a complex system will be in the future. It's not predictable. And this, of course, can be a challenge when we're working in a traditional environment where we have to do all that planning, budgeting stuff, telling up front when the, well, I'm sure you heard all about our famous airport in Germany when the Berliner Flughafen will be opened, finally. But the truth is, well, you can't tell. And um, this intransparency also means that we always work on a part, a piece of a system. We always look at parts and pieces. And this is, again, it's not a problem, but we should be aware of that, because the rest of the system is still living its dynamics. So this is why we always have to keep in mind that time is a factor. What I personally really love about complexity and complex systems, what leaders usually do not love that much, if they still stick to the old idea of leadership and management, is that you don't have a central control unit in those systems. You don't, can't have the idea of controlling, centralized controlling at all. So if you really have too many beer tonight at the hotel bar, you will recover from that during the day after, right? But there is no central unit in your body saying the rest, come on, get up and running again. It's because of the interconnectedness of the elements. It's because of the structure of your body that you will recover. And even your brain is not a central controlling unit at all. It's the structure, it's the interconnectedness that um, makes you feel better over time after having too many beer. And you could say, yeah, well, that might be true. But still, we r work and manage and lead and act in those systems, and we're successful. There must be a way to kind of control them or kind of influence them. And you're right. Of course, there is a possibility to influence complex systems, but it's something completely different from controlling it. Controlling would mean if I take this input, I know exactly that I get this output. This is control. What you can do is you can influence it. And the mechanism that you use, and you're doing that forever, of course, and you all know that, the mechanism that you use for that is called feedback. And I would love to see what's in your head now when I use the term feedback, where usually people think of those discussions where well, Victor, as my boss, tells me on a yearly basis how I performed, right? What he observed, which behavior, what he thinks is appropriate and which training I should take to get better in whatever. Or the 360 degree feedback for leaders or whatever. Nope. This is definitely not feedback. This is just sharing opinions, which can be fun. But it does not make sense if you want to change or influence a system. Feedback from a systems theory perspective is something that definitely changes the state of a system. And this is extremely important because 
um, feedbacks and feedback loops, you, you find them all over the place, all day long, but we're usually not trained to observe them. And this is why I want to stress that point a little bit and explain what feedback from that perspective um, really means. And maybe this is the, the, the time of the day where I do a non-charged kind of a job consultancy, if you like, where maybe you're tired of what you're doing in your job. Um, and if you want to change, I suggest that you become chicken farmers. Yeah, chicken farmers. And I will give you a kind, well, let's call it a starter kit. And the starter kit consists of uh, two chicken and one rooster. All healthy and all willing and able to do their job. <laughs> and so we're now we're making a simplified model of the world, of course. And I hope you can agree that if I say the more chicken we have, the more eggs we will get. Simplified model. You agree on that? Okay. So this is positive feedback. This really happens. The chicken, they are not saying, well, thank you very much for your feedback. I heard what you're saying. I understand that. I will think about it and maybe I will produce some eggs. No, they just do it. That's feedback. And this is positive feedback. And you read it the way, the more chicken, the more eggs we will get. The more eggs we have, the more chicken we will get. You agree? Okay, it okay, depends, simplified model, still simplified. So the more eggs we will have, the more chicken we will get. That's positive feedback again, and this is a loop. So this goes on forever. This is a positive feedback loop. The more chicken, the more eggs, the more eggs, the more chicken. What will happen is the loop, it's go, it goes on forever. And of course, we're working with a chicken in an agile environment. So we built a great stables. They are not forced to work ties any longer. We have flexible working hours. We have a launch area with a kind of a table soccer where they can play with little duck eggs. We recruited the best of the best of the best, sir, chicken from the market. They all went through a three-stage assessment center, of course. And we're, we're absolutely proud of our stable-owned kindergarten. And to find the right name for the kindergarten, we had a very long design thinking process. We really wrote a lot of sticky notes and we came up with a great name of Kikiriki. I personally really love that. But the good news is this goes on, right? It's a loop. What should happen? There are two things that I didn't mention. The first is there is no endless growth except with cancer. And we know how that this, oh, well, more or less uh, uh, leads to system destruction. This cycle is growth. This is why your boss says, come on, 50% more revenue next year. That's not a problem, right? What should happen? It's a loop. So there is no endless growth. And the second thing that I didn't mention is that the stables are built quite close to a big road called the B54. And the chicken crossed the road with more or less success. The more chicken we have, the more we cross the road. This is again positive feedback. You know that already, it's getting boring, right? The more chicken cross the road, the less chicken we will have. This is negative feedback. And negative feedback is, well, from some point of view, more important then the growth feedback loops are. And what we usually do when we want to achieve something, when we want to become more agile, when we want to become more successful, when we want to have more revenue, whatever, we focus on the positive feedback loop. And even if it, this is a metaphor for sure, but we focus on the chicken and we focus on the eggs. Well, maybe we focus on the stables as well and say, come on, uh, flexible workings, hour, blah, 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 blah. But we, um, well, a, a lot of times do not focus on the, on the broader view, on the environment. And you always have a B54. Always. There is no endless growth. There is no 
positive feedback loops without a negative feedback that is balancing. And when, when it comes to agility, I um, had an experience with one of my customers that was quite, quite obvious and quite good for that example. Is they started working the agile way in their IT projects and they were quite successful with that. The people were happy, they had more responsibility, more freedom, um, more space for making their own decisions and that was all paradise. And after a while they found out that the enthusiasm just had gone, but they didn't know why. They sat there and said, well, we have no idea what happened. And what we did is we observed the whole system. So we took a look at the environment as well. And in the end, what they found out is that um, in the overall organizations, the leaders still got their appreciation for having everything under control. So for knowing all the numbers and figures and can give an information about the state of every project of everything immediately. And it was not because the leaders were evil or they agreed on we have to undermine those agile projects, but that, that's what they did in the end. They started to undermining the projects because the company didn't have an answer for the open question. And the open question was, how do we get appreciated when it's no longer having everything under control? And that was in the end the B54. And what we should do um, when we want to achieve goals like more agile, transforming the way we work, we have or we should take a look what are the B54s that might come up. Because there will be B54s and there will be chicken crossing the road. So and these are just some aspects of, of complex systems. And where you might say, yeah, that's pretty straightforward, and yeah, maybe you say, I can agree on that, and I can take that into account, and that's fine. And still there are some, well, misconceptions around complexity. And I would like to talk to you about some of those misconceptions, because I think they're really essential, especially when you want to go for an agile way of doing something. always the miracle of technical things. Okay. Um, I tried to find out how the, um, the way of you get your tax declaration, your tax return done in Croatia, but I didn't really find out that much. Is your tax law, would you say it's it consists of huge amount of laws and processes, or is it very straightforward? Ah, okay, okay, okay. So in in Germany, it is um, the the tax law consists of hundreds of laws and thousands of processes and ways what you have to declare and how and stuff like that. And I tried to do my tax return stuff myself, but I failed because I didn't see through all these laws. Um, so I outsourced this to an expert, of course. And these days when we say we don't see through immediately, when we don't have a full picture of a situation at once, we tend to say, yeah, because it's so complex. Complex is a little bit like the old complicated. In former times, people were proud to solve complicated problems. Today, we're saying, well, you're still doing complicated ones. Yeah, I'm on the complex side of the world. So it's a little bit fancy and modern to um, do complex stuff. And it's a good um, explanation for everything where we don't see through at once. So the tax law, it, and it doesn't matter if it's in Germany, Croatia, or in the USA. The tax law is law written on paper, right? This can't be complex. That can be complicated. You, I can take the tax law as it is. I can put it in the cabin in the backyard and go on vacation for two weeks. When I come back, 
The tax law is still the same. Without any intervention from the outside, nothing happens. If I put my husband in a cabin in the backyard, he will not be the old one when I come back. And that's the difference between complicated and complex. And this is, as Niels mentioned it um, this morning, this is more than just the difference between two words. It's the difference between two worlds. Complicated is the linear world, where things are predictable, where I can tell about the cause and effect relationship up front, where I can analyze things. I can drill down into details, fix the details, and get the whole thing done. And complex is the nonlinear world, where I do have cause and effect relationships, but I just can tell about them in retrospective. I can't say up front. And by the way, every time we say things like, I could have told you that before, we may be lying, because we couldn't. It's just because afterwards we have an idea about which cause had which effect. So in a complex is the world where the, the, the traditional leadership management, project management, teamwork idea does not work any longer. Because we are in an environment which is non-predictable, where we might don't know the answer, the solution, or we might know the way to the solution. So this is why we need different approaches. And the agile way of working, uh, talking about um, the, the, pers the agile perspective, not about following a methodology, is a very good answer to that complexity. If you ask me, it's a very good answer when you um, understood what a complex system is about as well. So um, one of the misconceptions is that complex equals complicated. These terms are mixed up um, from time to time. And just to point that out again, um, what is challenging about complex systems, and this is true for every project, department, organization, company, that can't be predicted. And um, when we talk to um, leaders, when we talk with teams that want to work more agile, whatever, the question, as I stated at the beginning, is very often, how do we get the people to change their mind? How, would it, how do we get the people to change their behavior? How do we get the people on board, even if they do not have a boat anyway? And um, well, for me, that's just not the right question anyway. In a complex environment, it does make more sense to create the right environment than just to heal the people. So set the boundaries, set the constraints of a system and um, again, as Neil already stated this morning, is we're quite system conform in our behavior. So um, system theories, people, they, they don't say we don't care about the people, but we first of all take a look at the system and at the environment and at the context, instead of just looking at the personality of the individuals. Um, one of my very beloved misconceptions is there is the computer. Well, it doesn't help that the... Okay. Um, in your companies, do you have a metaphor for change or for transformation? Do you have a picture that you use? Change is like... You're really using the journey or something else? Roller coaster, okay. Any of you that is familiar with the metaphor change as a journey? Okay, you're, you're nodding quite... Um, um, I can't hear you, you're nodding, but that's fine. <laughs> um, change as a journey is a misconception that is... Well, I, I'm very experienced in the German-speaking country, so there it's really... Um, it's still very popular. And they immediately tell you about that that journey is a hard one winding ways, it's tearful, it has to be, but in the end there may be possibly under specific circumstances there might be maybe a change. 
And um, where if you familiar with change is a journey, you might also be familiar with a change curve. Somebody working with a change curve? Okay, then I'm making friends now. Um, and I, I want to I wanna stress that as well because I kind of love that idea that change is a journey which is hard and tearful. And then you know the change curve and this is more or less um, the value that everybody has to go through while you're changing something. So it's the valley of tears. It's the hard part of the journey. And you might all know this or have seen this change curve pretty much looks like this, right? And it has some stages. The first is denial. Okay? Then there is anger. Then there is um, negotiation. There is depression. And there is acceptance. You're fine with that? Also, you're familiar with that? Okay. okay. So, this is the so-called change curve. Um, but they all miss one step in this curve. And this is a, a step up here when you made it out of the valley of tears, where you cried, where you negotiated, where you had this depression. And here it is, after all. When you survive the valley of tears, there it is, death. <laughs> A lot of people, they just don't have an idea where this model comes from. And this model comes from Elisabeth Kübler-Ross. It's the so-called Kübler-Ross curve. And she came up with a model saying that there are five phases that an individual goes through on his way of dying. Five steps that we usually go through when we're dying. So there is death at the end of every change process, right? And sometimes there is kind of death after a change. So taking this model one-to-one -to, -one to explain organizational changes is just absurd. For both, for those who are dying and for um, the rel uh, relevance. Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, my main point is this is a model for individuals in the death of or in the process of dying. What does it have to do with organizational change? Nothing. So it's just absurd to take it one to one. And this is not how change happens in a complex system. But it's 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 uh, kind of easy and easy going to take that model because you always talk about something in the future. You stick with saying, yeah, maybe, after, after the valley of tears and after those depressions and anger and we all know that the employers will always say, no, we don't want that change, then there may be, possibly, under specific circumstances, hopefully, eventually, there will be a change. So we do not have to act, actually, when we talk about the future. But you can't directly change or influence the future. It's pretty much like the culture. You can't directly predict the future. But what you can change is um, your agreement on how you work together. So change happens now and not in the future. And if you observe people that are kind of what you diagnose as uh, change resistant, and there are maybe only a few people. Yeah, maybe they have a personal thing with whatever, but they don't really have an impact on the whole system. If you observe a lot of people where you diagnose change resistance, is it resistant? It's a pattern. And if you observe a pattern, it's a very good feedback into your system because it tells you something about your system works and then maybe you should think about the change at all. Maybe the change is stupid or the way you want the change to happen. So take it as a feedback. Take it as your system is telling you something about what, what is 
um, what works and what doesn't. And um, one thing that is um, well, also challenging, I would say, is the um, idea that systems are, by definition, conservative. They are more than happy to find their a kind of stability, to find a, a, a point of, um, gosh, how do I pronounce it? Equilibrium? Is that a kind of right pronunciation? <laughs> okay, you know what I um, want to talk to. And if you want to change a system, you, you really have to disturb it. You have to irritate it. And you have to think uh, more about the structure. So view all the feedbacks going on in your system. You get an idea about the dynamics going on. And then you have the idea what the structure of your system really is. And that is the part of a system where you can really um, initiate change. And so um, people like me, they more believe in change is happening on the structural level or should be initiated on the structural level instead of just working on the individuals and on the people. So n now we know each other for quite a while, we know each other very well, and um, I would like to do a, also do a kind of an experiment. No, what, how did you call it? You did some science? Okay, I would like to do some science too. You hopefully all have a pen and some kind of paper. And I need Victor's assistance for a second, because I would like to play a game with you, but I, I didn't make it to pronounce it in Croatian. Stadtland Fluss, it's called in Germany. <laughs> so you all know that game? Yes? It's, it's still quite dark in here. Did you say yes? Stadtlandfluss? So in English it's called categories and it's... Um, I explain the rules to you anyway because we're playing the adult version. Usually I would give you a category and a first letter. And then you would find the very first um, word term that comes into your mind fitting that category starting with that letter, right? Right? Good. <laughs> so we, we skip that with the first letter. I just give you a category and I really don't care what the first letter of the word is that you find, except you have to be fast. That's the adult version. So if I give you, would give you the category um, car, I don't mind if you write down Mercedes, BMW, whatever, but you have to be fast. So the rhythm in which I give you a category is pretty much like this. So it would be good if you're up and running and have um, your pen and paper ready, because you really have to hurry up. For every word that you find and write down, you get five points. For every word that you missed, minus five. Goal of the game, as many points as possible. Okay, you're ready for takeoff? <coughs> then you get the... F uh, oh, by the way, I've never played that outside German-speaking countries. It will be an interesting experience anyway. So you're ready for takeoff. Good. First category is a color, a flower, a crafts tool, a musician instrument. Stop. And I would love to hear which color did you write down. Can I see the red people? Oh, okay, okay. Flower? The, the rose writers? A little bit more, okay. So now, please perform now. Now comes the tipping point of this game. The crafts tool? Ah. Hammer? Yeah, yeah, okay. And the last one, musician instrument? Okay, it's a little bit more diverse than in uh, German-speaking countries. And just to let you know, um, it's not that obvious this time, but um, well, I had an idea about what you might write down up front. And this is a cultural thing, of course. Wait, and this is, this is um, an experiment if you're kind of normal, ordinary people, 
Niels, you're ordinary? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I always had the idea that this... So what does it tell about you? And what the funny thing about this little game is that people start counting how many fits they have because we all want to be individuals, right? We don't want to be sheep in a herd, but we are. So the thing about individualism has been a lie, always has been. But anyway, this is a cultural thing. And if you play this in Japan, for example, or in England, or in Croatia, you get slightly different answers, of course. But that's not what I want to tell you. Is um, you write down what, or you wrote down what you wrote down because you didn't think about it. There was um, high pressure um, in this game. You didn't have the time to think about. Oh, what was my favorite color? Yeah, I think it is blue. I write down blue. You didn't have the time for that, so you had to get information faster than via thinking. So you get the information from the subconscious. There is where our beliefs, our mental model, our stereotypes are stored. So the things that are so clear that we don't have to rethink them every day. And this, again, is what kind of um, steers us most of the time, uh, it, it also during work. And the mental models that we share in organizations, they might prevent us from becoming more agile, or they might help us. Or maybe it's just um, that we should be aware of some central models, at least of what we think about human beings, for example. And it's not that we should work on that and get, be aware of every single belief that we have and change it. It's um, even more important to get aware of, uh, of that because the mental model that we have in organizations is the reason for the structure that we decide that we want to have. And um, in the structure, again, is um, defined the way we work together. There's defined if we are able in this organization to work in an agile way or if we run into struggle um, the whole time. Okay, so, and, and you know if you're um, a normal person or not. Um, one misconception in the agile world as well as when it comes to complex systems is that still, if you do good planning, you will win the project, the revenue, the whatever. So good planning is is everything is still one of the number one misconceptions. And I can understand that because we're trained on thinking this way for ages. So why should we just say immediately, yeah, come on, are you thinking? I, I've never had um, great interest in planning, so I skip it. When we think that this gives us the um, security that we might look for in non-predictable uh, contexts. And um, there is a German sociologist called Dietrich Dörner who wrote a, a great book called, uh, oh gosh, in English should be called The Logic of Failure. And um, this is a recommendation to read it. Um, and in um, his book he describes one experiment that he did several years ago. He invited um, about 50 people to do a um, computer simulation, and in this simulation they ran a city as mayors. So they were mayors, dictator-like mayors, um, in a city called Lohausen. Lohausen, um, in this simulation, had around, I don't know, I think with 4,000 inhabitants, uh, normal infrastructure, um, the, um, uh, the main um, monetary, um, center was a clock, uh, oh, I'm running out of English words, fabric, a clock factory, sure. <laughs> and um, they set up some, some key factors like um, um, the happiness of the inhabitants, um, how well the clock factory works, stu stuff like that. And then these about 50 people could do as mayors whatever they want in Lohausen to make that city grow and be great. 
And the simulation ran over a time period of for 10 years, so 10 years in Lohausen. And during the experiments, Dietrich Dörner divided the um, participants kind of two um, types of mayors, the good ones and the bad ones. And the good ones, they uh, made a lot of decisions. They always looked at situations or problems um, in a kind of systemic way, so they looked for interconnectedness, they, could, they looked for, um, for relations, they looked for feedbacks. They always had uh, ideas on what they could try to do something, on uh, ideas on how they can intervene in the system. And the bad mayors on the other side, they did very few decisions at all. They looked at situations and problems quite isolated. Um, they didn't have that many ideas and they took um, what happened as, yeah, well, you can, can't do anything about it. If the context is this, what can I do? So they, they, um, they really had not that many ideas at all. And, um, well, for example, there was one bad mayor who calculated the average distance from an elderly person's flat to a phone booth. He did that to then calculate where in Lohausen to establish phone booth so that all the elderly people were happy to find within a... So, this thing was no task neither a KPI or, or something. He just created a problem that he was able to solve. And this is, I think this is quite, well, this is quite obvious and quite a good thing to do. If we don't see through, if we don't have any clue what to do in this situation and where to intervene, we still want to find anything that we can grab. So, as human beings, we have several strategies to cope with that situation. And one strategy is what, they, what we call encapsulation. So we define problems that, are, that do not exist, but problems that we're able to solve. Because it feels much better to solve a problem than to say, I have no clue. Another strategy that Dietrich Dörner came up with is that we start finger pointing. As long as Victor doesn't deliver the package work X, Y, Z. Well, I can't do anything. It's just because of him. He didn't deliver, did he? So finger pointing is a strategy if we don't see through to, to get out of that situation. Or we start to uh, drill the work or the problem down into many, many details and try to control the details. So in, in small pieces where we think we have them under control. And so the, the thing is that the, the, the situations, the problems, the ways to something that are not predictable, they make us, as human beings, use strategies to get out of it, but these strategies are not very suitable for the situation at all. And this, again, is that this might become a problem if we just, I don't know, encapsulate or start finger-pointing. Um, so this is why we should be aware of that. And um, a great, big, wide planning is great for complicated tasks and problems. You can do as lot of planning as you would like to. That's fine. Planning in the linear, straightforward way is not suitable for complex problems or complex tasks. And it, in the end, is the first thing, well, from my point of view, when we're dealing with complexity, and this is true for every organization project uh, team um, that we work in, the first step is to just um, accept the uncertainty. Accept the uncertainty and start using terms like, I don't know, Victor, but I have ideas what we can try. Um, we collect the, um, the intelligence from all the others, we collect the ideas, we have experiences in the past, and we try to get an idea about the intervention that we should use on the system. And these are some of the very um, popular misconceptions around um, complexity, and I think they're quite 
important, especially when we start to work in a more agile way, because this often means that we skip processes, we skip kind of internal regulation, so we make more space and more freedom. And um, this means that we should be more aware that we are acting in a complex environment, because this is not just a nice word, um, but it means something for the work that we're doing and the way we should look at it and should do it. So, and um, these are some of the, the very few. There are additional more, of course. And if you ask me what should every agilist, every um, agile working person um, study or be aware of, I would say, uh, the complexity that it the, is the basis um, for the way we work together. Thank you very much and stay successful. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your speech. I believe there are questions in the audience. You don't have to use the microphone if you don't want to. <laughs> Can I have a question if no one else will? <laughs> Did you ever try doing this word game with kids? Because I have a theory that we all lose ourselves while growing up. So I believe that kids would give completely different answers to what color is their favorite, what musical instrument. It's more of a comment than a question, but. Um, well, no, I haven't. But my idea would be that the, that the answers should be quite similar because it's a cultural it's a cultural thing, so they should. I will try it out at home, because <laughs> yeah. I'm, really, I'm really interested in what will happen. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it was very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.